So, hallo zu meinem Vortrag Designing for Laser Cutting. Ich bin Florian Festi, ich bin der Autor von Boxes.py, einem äh, Boxgenerator. Ähm, ich mache Laser Cutting seit jetzt fast zehn Jahren und äh, ich würde sagen, ich habe immer noch sehr, sehr viele Dinge da nicht gemacht, aber ich dachte, ich mache mal jetzt das guter Zeitpunkt, um mal ein bisschen Fazit zu machen und zu gucken, was man so gelernt hat. Ähm, warum ist Laser... Warum ist Laser, Laser Cutting interessant? Sie sind im Wesentlichen schnell, relativ einfach zu bedienen. Meiner Meinung nach die einfachste Maschine, die wir im Space, im Space haben. Sie sind präzise. Also wir machen so Fingerzinken auf Plus, Minus immer so in zwei, zwei Hundertstel Millimeter Schritten, um die Pressung einzustellen. Ähm, Nachteil ist, sie sind eben halt inhärent 2D. Das ist einer der Gründe, warum sie leicht zu bedienen sind. Ähm, und das heißt, man muss sich irgendwas überlegen, wie man von den 2D dann zu 3D kommt. Und das heißt außerdem meistens, wenn man was ausschaltet, muss man es danach zusammenbauen, weil die Teile eben flach sind. Ähm, äh, worüber wollen wir jetzt reden? Ich, der Vortrag ist im Wesentlichen so zweigeteilt. Ich will im ersten Teil so ein bisschen über Engineering. Ich wollte eigentlich auf Englisch reden, oder? Warum rede ich Deutsch? Das ist verwirrend. Äh, so, der Talk has uh, two parts. <lacht> <lacht> First part is about engineering, so we're talking about uh, strength and stiffness, which are one of the major uh, properties. And we'll talk a bit about uh, Bleiwolf as a building material, which is, uh, has special <laughs> properties that are distinct from many other uh, isotropic materials. And after that, there will be a second uh, part where we talk about solutions to common problems and uh, what um, features we can use and what how to use them uh, to their best abilities. Short disclaimer, I'm not a mechanical engineer. Uh, the, this talk will not make you one. And so please don't use this to build something that kills people. Um, if, if, if you want to build bridges or something, please, please study first. Um, so the first thing that might be inter uh, of interest is uh, that the things we build are strong enough to not break. Um, there are a couple of different properties that materials or things have, and they can be pretty confusing. We are not going over every, we are only looking at two of them. There are a couple of more like uh, uh, toughness and um, hardness, which are related, but not the same. So strength is the uh, ability of a piece to withstand forces without breaking. Um, there, um, there are basically two things. One is the strength of a thing, and the other is a strength of a material. Material have a, a strength, which is basically a, a pressure that they can withstand. And they can withstand it in uh, basically three things, in compression, in tension, um, and in shearing. And the thing itself can also be bent or, or torqued. Um, and the stress they can withstand is, uh, is a pressure, so it's uh, measured in Pascal, which is uh, newtons per square meter. When you design something, you need to basically look what strength your loads would result in, and then look if your material is strong enough or uh, adjust. And you often want to put a safety factor in that, so you want to make your thing three times stronger than it needs to be. One reason for this is real safety, like in case you miscalculated something. And this other thing is uh, fatigue. A lot of materials will get damaged over time if they're loaded repeatedly. And so sometimes a, a three is a good number in general, but there's different applications have diff basically different ideas on what, what safety margin is, is necessary. Uh, or can be afforded a lot of applications like error engineering or aerospace, which are tied on, on weight, might choose smaller values. Um, something that sounds similar but is different is stiffness. Stiffness is not about breaking, it is about uh, the GIF a part has if it is loaded uh, with a given strength. Um, so it's, the, the general thing is everything is a Everything is a spring, so if, whenever there's a force, something moves. Um, often you, we can't see that because it's so little, but it does move. 
Um, the material property that's affecting this is the Young's modulus or E module in German. Um, uh, it's a material property, so basically, depending on what material you use, your part will be more or less stiff. The second thing that uh, that's uh, important here is the moment of uh, second moment of area, which we will go into de in detail. Don't be too shocked. We will be talking about a few uh, formulas, but they are not for you to actually do calculations more, getting an idea of how this all works. The main takeaway here is that uh, stiffness is often more important than strength because you will often not load your part up to uh, to your breaking uh, forces, but often, even if things shift around, uh, around too much, that's no good. So mechanism may no longer work, your gears might mis be misaligned, um, it must, might just feel not great if you touch something and it's squishy, you often want uh, a certain stiffness, even if it won't break. Um, if you don't need any stiffness, you can use uh, fabric, which has uh, no stiffness at all. Uh, and it won't break on you, but it, uh, you can't stand it up. So, um, loads and stresses, when you, when you think of a thing, there's stresses are forces that are mi minuscule part of your, uh, minuscule piece of your part can experience. So these are basically fundamental on the Minecraft cube uh, forces. And there are three of them. One is compression, one is tension, and there's shearing. Shearing is if, if you basically try to move things past each other. Um, this is uh, often only seen if things actually fail in that way. And it's called shearing for a reason. That's what shears does, what shears do. So scissors are typically cutting, but if you have uh, like rebar cutters, they will shear the, the steel by just pushing it uh, to the side. And there are loads, which basically means forces you put on a part and that will lead to stresses, but they are not fundamental. One of them is bending, which can lead to all three of the stresses above. Uh, and then there's torsion, which means basically twisting a part from, from both ends. So there's a whole, for, for bending alone, there's a whole theory. Um, uh, you, and um, we will not go into that in detail, but just know there's a lot of more mathematics and there's a couple of formulas for the easy parts and there's a finite element analysis for complicated parts, but typically we don't need that. We just want to get a quick idea how this all works. So when we're bending something, there's a bending torque. A torque is basically... Uh, a force multiplied by a lever, and all the bending forces are like this. And the length of the lever depends on the scenario. We'll look at two very sim the two simplest ones to get an idea how this feels. If you don't like bending, you can use a truss. A truss is a construction with uh, beams that are all loaded only in compression or tension, so there are none. No none element is 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 is, is experience any bending forces, but then you then there's trust theory, which tells you how all these forces work, and th that's another kettle of fish we are not going into. So here's the simplest thing. That's a cantilever beam. It's basically just uh, fixed on one end, and there's a force on the other end. It's basically the simplest thing. It's just a lever. Um, and this is basically the definition of, of torque. It's the torque moment is, is the length of the beam times the force applied. So that's all this is. Um, there's the formula for how much it bends. So it's the force, the length is uh, cubed. So that's the reason why long things are very floppy. So why you can, if you've ever seen a, a railroad track that's not has been uh, bolted down yet, and they flop around like noodles, although they are like steel in this size. This is one of the reasons, because the L is cubed, so they are very floppy if they are long enough. Um, and there are two other um, letters that are important. One is E. This is the uh, 
Young's modulus, that's basically the stiffness of the material. And the other is uh, I, this is the uh, second moment of inertia. That's the basically the area of the, of the beam resisting. There's a formula for this, which will look later, but it's basically uh, how the beam looks in, in what the shape is and how which size it has. And the, the bigger it is, obviously, the less uh, floppy it is. So there's a lot of uh, other formulas for, for other easy cases, like having uh, the load distributed differently, a typical case is having basically the weight of the beam, looking at the weight of the beam, basically the weight being distributed over the whole length and stuff. That's something you look up if you're interested. We are only interested in saying, well, this is a beam, there's a torque, that's it. Here's another case. There's a beam, there's a, there's a load. The difference is now it's supported on both sides. The important thing here is that they're, while they are supported, they are not held in place. So that when the beam bends, it can twist in the ends without anything resisting. Because if you do that, the scenario uh, changes a lot. So we can see the load under, uh, the bending moment underneath. The bending moment is uh, biggest in the middle. And the maximum moment is, a four, is only a fourth of that of the other case. Why is this? It's very simple. If we hold the beam here in the middle, and then we have two forces that pushing that up. And this one in the middle, if we hold onto here, we don't need any force. So it's basically like this is a beam that's held in place here and then pushed up here. So we have a beam of half the length, but we're also splitting up the force into two sides. So that's, why the, that's the reason why it's only a fourth of the, of the other case, because it's basically uh, the same case, half the size, half the fourth. And as such, the, the bending is also a lot less. We are, it's basically the same formula, but instead of dividing by 8, we are now dividing by uh, 48 because of all the smaller forces and lengths. So what do we want to keep here? There are different types of, of these bending scenarios. They are basically different by the factor in front, and otherwise they are basically all the same. It's basically all the length, and the length differ depending on how the beam is, is, is put in place. So um, next thing we are interested in is uh, how this second moment of, of area or inertia that's used interchangeably um, looks like. And I have brought you a bit com more complicated example, but it's that's basically a rectangular uh, uh, tube with a hole in the middle that's also rectangular. And basically, we are just um, subtracting the term from the outside uh, rectangle. Uh, we uh, take the box from the outside rectangle and, and subtract the one in the middle. And the interesting part is that the moment is basically proportional to the width b and the height cubed. So that means if you're making this uh, twice as height, we get eight times the resistance. So this makes a huge difference. So whenever we have a, a construction that we think is, looks a bit flimsy, increasing the height will do a lot for us. Like doubling the height will basically make a world of difference. And so often even uh, doing a little, uh, increase it a little bit will, will be sufficient. Um, this is also, um, of course, true if you have other shapes, they have other factors in front, but it, that doesn't really matter. Um, so, for example, if you have a screw and think, well, that looks a bit flimsy, let's take an M8 instead of an M6, that doesn't sound like a huge difference. Yes, it is a huge difference. It's in, because the width is also increasing, so it's basically to the fourth power. Basically, doubling the diameter of an axle increases the the, the, the moment by 16. So going from M6 to M12 is a huge difference. That's um, maybe something for all those driving contraptions cons, uh, contraption that are around here. So if you, there's a lot you can do with just the diameter. So on the 
not, not quite as good news is what's the next so there are two we are still looking at two things one is the uh, is the stiffness and the other one is the strength and the strength um, for the strength the question is what's the maximal stress that the part can withstand and the part will fail at that point that is mostly that's loaded the most and the uh, most stress is on the top very top and very bottom of the bending beam of course and the stress throughout is uh, is basically the moment uh, the bending moment divided through the through the uh, moment of inertia but it's multiplied by the distance from the center line so we're losing one uh, power so basically while this is called z it's basically proportional to the height it's basically height the half of the height depending on what shape we have some shapes have different um, are not as are not symmetrical, so it may be a little bit different. But basically, this removes one power for the um, for the uh, um, for the strength. So the strength is one power less than the stiffness, but still, um, it's still at least a quadratic with the height. So it's it's worth increasing the height. So there's two more things we want to look in here before we move out of this whole theory stuff. Just torsion, which means twisting a piece around. From a mathematics point of view, that basically works very much the same as everything else. There's a, there's a, a polar moment of area that we're using. It's also power of four. Because we are, of course, uh, we basically we have last time we had power of three of the height and then the width. Now we, are, if you're looking at the circle, for example, with the power of four of the of the diameter. The problem here is so far we could basically choose which axis we are wanting to 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 bend to, and the other, if the other one is weak, it doesn't matter that much. So if you have something that's very high and, and slim, yes, it's not as big as as great as being. Uh, wider, but it's only linear. Here, things are different because we are rotating it, so it's basically the, the formula for compli more complicated uh, shapes are more complicated than just bending. And basically, we want to have as much of a diameter everywhere. So having a circle is obviously the best shape. Having a square is still good. Uh, having a very slim beam is not great. And the worst things are slotted things. So if you have basically a C, if you have a pipe and cut it in length, it can't resist much because basically the 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 surface that has to carry all those uh, force has to basically take a 180 twice and that's uh, really really bad. What happens if you actually do that is that the two sides slide against each other when you bend those. And if it's if it's uh, connected instead if you have a tube Basically, they can't slide into anywhere, and the forces are going basically as a spiral from one side to the other, both in tension and compression. And so that's something to keep in mind if you are looking at torsion. Uh, another fun thing is buckling. Um, this happens whenever a, a member in compression tries to evade the force by moving to the side. Um, that's bad, of course, because if you're compressing something, you're basically uh, um, counting on the area being there. And as soon as this buckles, so it's bending upwards, and then the the bowing makes the geometry less stable, of course. So in, you're turning a compression into a bending moment, and it, that can uh, lead to catastrophic failure if it basically collapses on itself. Uh, that's one reason why we can't make these beams as thin as we want to. For one, it, it makes the uh, torsion stiffness very weak, but it also makes it easy, uh, prone to buckling. That's why a lot of uh, construction beams are using uh, typically I or H beams, which are wider on the top and front. And they could, of course, just have a, a round bar on top and front to have the area but making them wide gives, for one, gives it some stiffness for bending in the other axis, but also um, prevents buckling. 
So having something too slim is n slim is optimizing for in one direction, but keeps you weak in others. One thing is there's no buckling in tension. Whenever you pull something, it will pull straight. So um, that's one thing to, uh, to avoid. And uh, uh, some constructions are using this cranes, for example, that have the tension member only as a wire or a, a steel bar, which is uh, lighter and doesn't need any additional width to get stiffness. And have this, they have the width only in the compression part of the, of the construction. Uh, as we are in bending, there's another fun thing that I ran into. This is, I've not found an Amer English word for this. It's called Schubladen effect. It's basically if you have uh, a drawer that's too wide and too shallow, it will bind up. And it binds up because the lever, if you're pushing there, the lever, bind, the leverage for binding up is better than the force for pushing it in. It's something that's used, for example, in F clamps. Uh, where you screw it in and it locks in place, but if you loosen them, you can move them up and down. And that's uh, also something, if you do constructions that where you have sliding things, make sure that the, the length of your support is long enough to deal with the offset of your forces. So I did made this nice little clamp um, for clamping uh, material to the, uh, to the knife table of the laser cutter. And the first one was too short. The, the sliding part was too short and would just not move at all as soon as you're not, unless you're pulling it fully straight. And just making it like a centimeter longer fixed the problem completely. It's really, it's really amazing how, how much uh, difference there is being one side of the of the border or the other. Of course, you can lower friction. That also helps because that's basically friction against the, the ratio here. But often you are limited or have already done everything to do that. Good. That's that's the theoretical part. Um, next thing um, to think about is the material we're using. I'm talking plywood here. Uh, the plastics are a bit different, but. There are not that many easy to cut plastics that are used, can be used for construction with laser cutters, polystyrene, probably there are a couple more, but they are all not cutting that great. And uh, acrylic that cuts really well is not a great construction material because it's relatively brittle, which is another uh, material property we're not talking about it today, but it makes stuff break easily. Um, wood is a lot lighter than steel, which is another usual uh, building material and something that will, you will encounter when putting other stuff onto your laser cuts, things like screws or ball bearings or whatever. Um, the main wood is an actually pretty good construction material. It is relatively strong, giving it we its weight. The problem is it has the strength only in one direction. And it's very weak in the other direction. Uh, this is um, compensated to some degree by plywood that are glued in two directions. So you have at least half of the strength within the sheet, but you still have the weakness across this sheet. So if you glue the sheet to something, you still only have the weak uh, direction of fiber to fiber uh, to hold this in place. As a result, you need 10 to 20 times the length to, 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 um, to get the force into the, into the sheet. Then you have, uh, over the length, the, the, basically the, the force can <laughs> move into the, thick, into the depth of the material. This is to some extent uh, better if you have... Uh, plywood with a lot of layers, because basically each layer uh, can do this on its own. Not if you're gluing the, only the top layer, but if you're, if you're putting the forces on, on all sides, um, basically moving them around. For example, if you want to move the force around a corner within a, one piece of plywood, 
um, you basically only need to move it from one layer to another, which may be only a millimeter. So you only need like 10 millimeters or, tr or 20. So it's, you only need a centimeter to actually be able to move this force around the corner, which is still not nothing if you're thinking about all the small uh, figure joints we're using, but it's much more doable as if this was a massive piece of wood that we have to glue to something else where we would need much more um, area. So the, the next problem is that steel and uh, is much harder and much more heavy than wood. That it makes it also hard to move forces from a steel part to a wooden part because the wood ha doesn't have the, the strength to actually move the move the force somewhere. So you're limited basically by the, by the strength of the wood to take the, the forces from a steel part. So the obvious way to do, uh, to do that is to increase this, the area by using washers or using oh, you oversized your steel parts, use an axle that's thicker than it needs to be. So you have at least some, some area to, to hold on to. Um, but often that's not desirable because for one, it gets ex more expensive, and then it um, gets heavier. And if you're, if it needs to be moved around, that's that's bad. Um, one solution can be using bell bearings. I'm they are bell bearings are like LEDs. They are just too cheap if they are small, and everyone uses them. And I'm not a big fan, but they have it, their uses, and they can be used here to just increase their area because the outside of the ball bearing is, of course, much bigger than the inside. And you can still use a thinner axle with that. Um, another option is to just not use steel. So basically, try to, to laser cut the pieces you need also from, from, from wood or some other material. Or use something that, that's lighter, like, like some plastic parts. I've got a couple of numbers here. Maybe I will not really go over them. Um, the things I always keep in my head is the density of the materials, which is for wood is like 0.3 to 0.8, depending on, on what you have. Poplar is very light. Birch is more on the upper side. There's hardwoods that are even heavier. Uh, aluminium is uh, 2.7. These are all kilograms per liters or tons per cubic meters if you're building something bigger. And steel is about eight. So that's a huge difference. It's basically factor 10, I said before, even for heavier woods. Um, we are not going over all the other strengths. Um, you can see that uh, st steel especially has a huge margin on what, what strength it, it can have. Mild steel is not really better than wood when we're talking about uh, specific uh, strength. So if we, if we count on weight, but there are hardened steels that are very, very <laughs> uh, good, but they are of course also a pain to work with. So they're, they're, they don't really compare in the sense that you can easily laser cut them and put them together. They, are, they need heat treatment and all kind of other stuff. We're not. Metallurgy is a black art. We are not going into, into that. So what are the, the, the tips we, we can learn from that? One thing is try to keep all your forces within the walls because the height of your wall is, is the height of your beam and it is multiplied or it's, it's taken to the third and fourth power. So, or second and third power for, for strength and, and stiffness. And that's a lot even for smallish things. Um, if you're looking away from a, just a single beam, but for larger constructions, um, it's good to have things enclosed on all sides, basically. Um, there's, we have a box like this. This is relatively st uh, strong, but this is, for example, weak in this direction, because here we're basically relying on the, on the bending of the of the of the joints here. And so if we had a wall in here, this would much, 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 much uh, uh, stronger. So 
Often it's uh, worth just putting a wall somewhere, and even if you cut a huge hole in them, it still stiffens out things a lot. If it, if it is round, you basically have a triangle-shaped quarter circles in the corners that, that will stiffen those out a lot. Um, if you have a larger contraption, there may be parts that you really care about, that they stay in place, and uh, what I would suggest is you, you basically in your mind, grab them and push them around and look for if you have support for all six dimensions or actually 12 basically moving in this axis, this axis, this axis, and then also twisting in all three uh, uh, directions. And if you have all of them properly uh, supported, it's very surprising how stiff and how stable something can be. I have built a... a cocktail robot, and there's a platform hovering basically in free air, and all it com compresses is very flimsy three millimeter arcs. There are six of them, two on each side and one going to the back. And although you can basically bend them with your finger, small fingertips to the side, in combination, all those arcs are supporting the platform very, very well and doesn't move barely at all. Even there's some arm on top that moves quite quickly. So that's the next tip, basically make sure that the stiffness doesn't come from one part that, that's strong, but from the overall construction, make sure you support all possible forces. And the next thing I would uh, suggest, although we have seen all those formulas, I would rather suggest not to use those. The main problem is you basically set up, have to set up a scenario that you then do the calculation on. And it's really, so if you need my talk for doing the calculation, you will have even more trouble setting up a proper scenario. So you need to make all kinds of assumptions on what are the forces, which are the directions of the forces, which forces I care about. Then that's rather, rather troublesome to get that right. Um, of, because of these huge uh, uh, powers of these uh, um, strengths, Eyeballing that works really, really well. And if you're in doubt, just at 50%, uh, and then it typically will work out fine. So that's the theory. Let's, let's look into some of, some of, the, of the techniques that can be used with laser cutting. Um, and of course, the first question was, how do we get from 2D to 3D? And the simplest way of doing this is just gluing layers on top of each other. I, for some reason, have not found this box that should have been in our um, hackerspace somewhere. Um, so what you can you do with that? You can do lips and slots to slot something else in there. You can put mounting features. So if you, if you want to have like raised uh, points where you can screw in PCBs or stuff like this, it's all some things you can just glue on top of each other. Um, PCB enclosures, if they are flat, it's probably I, 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 I'm a Swabian, so I'm hesitant of wasting material, but you still, for very thin, low-profile stuff, it's probably easier to just glue up four layers of stuff on top of each other than co construct a more complicated thing. This uh, example on the left is a bayonet uh, lock for, for the lid. So it's basically you put it in and, and twist it, and then it locks in place. Um, Another way of doing this is just to use a 3D model and put it in a slicer. That's how this thing here got created. That's basically just a 3D model uh, cut up with a, I think it's even a standard uh, uh, 3D printing slicer that has, that has some option to, to just not have the path, but just to have the different layers as a geometry. One tip for that is it's often useful to nest this in an, in, within each other. So if you have something like this, you probably, well, it doesn't really have a, a tip, but you can probably put a tip and put it in here somewhere because you only need a limited uh, thickness for the wall. So you can basically nest pieces in different sizes into each other to, to save space. And that's also something which is done here. So basically the inner parts are all from the same piece uh, 
from this all layer is basically just one piece and the inner parts are just cut out. I'm not a big fan of using the, the curve of the laser as a, as a measurement that shows up in the part, but for this it's, it's okay in my opinion. Um, so the question is how do you assemble this? We see here a lip on the, on the bottom. Um, my preferred method is just to use uh, locating pins. That's something that, that's done in, in uh, m machine construction a lot. Um, but here you just put ro uh, small holes in there. One millimeter is fine. Just use small nails to locate your pieces, then glue them. And if you're, in most cases, I just pull the, uh, the nails out afterwards. If you have something thicker, you can also just hammer them in and, and keep them in there as a reinforcement. Um, that's, in my opinion, the easiest way. Another way is to just use uh, laser cut packs, basically have a square hole with one material thickness squared, and then cut, cut small pieces either with a, a, a top uh, head that, that, that locks them, uh, that puts them on the right uh, height or just flush and hammer them in. Another uh, way is to have C clamps, basically have a slot on the side and have a, a C shaped piece that where, where the layers are all basically stacked inside. And if you have two of them, they are also located. Um, for stuff that needs a lot of uh, torque, like small uh, gears or pinions, you can also think about putting thicker metal rods, like thicker nails in there to transfer the torque um, that can be useful. So finger joints, I guess everyone has seen them already. They are everywhere. Um, so I'm not talking about the, the obvious stuff too much. Um, you can use them in other angles than 90 degrees, but they lose a lot of glue uh, surface area. So they are much, much weaker. They look cool, but don't rely too much on, on this, these kind of uh, uh, finger joints. Also, it's not possible to design them in a way that are, that are, uh, create closed uh, surfaces. So we'll always have holes or, or gaps in between. By the, um, you can get rid of the, f the gaps on one side, basically, uh, of, but you can't get both sides without gaps even if, you f if you're willing to send off the, the overhangs. Um, um, generally, the smaller the fingers are, the stronger is the joint, because it decreases the, the glue area, and the morphing bas basically gives additional glue area on top and bottom of the fingers. So um, this, is, this is useful because bending like this is the main weakness of these kind of joints because that's also bending. Uh, we basically have the whole length of the one side as a, as a lever to pry them apart. We only have the material thickness to withstand that. So that's a good reason to always have like a top and bottom piece. That's one of the reason why there's a, a, this round part on top. It keeps all those together and prevents from bending st stresses getting onto those non-90 degrees joints. Um, there are two ways to do this uh, finger joints. One is symmetrical, that's what we are doing here. So we have two sides, basically one with the fingers uh, uh, going out and one where the fingers going in. Um, there's a different way of doing them, which are not shown here, which is basically, uh, they're symmetrical, where all the fingers are on the left side and they're, they're going in on the right side. And because basically if you have a part and they have a direction basically this round and if you're all putting the pieces together basically with the same side up, they will always fit because this goes this way and this goes this way, this round. So they will always fit. If you put one on top, it will also work. So, but the, the technically much better ver uh, version is using finger holes. That's basically fingers on one side and holes on the other side. That's our arcade that uses this. For one, it uh, increases the gluing area, but more important, when we bend this now, we are pressing always against material. 
So we're always, uh, we basically increase the pressure when we're bending it, so it's making it harder to pull out. The uh, um, thing that's a bit tricky is if you want to put two things from two sides at the same place, that can be done, but you basically have to skip part thing, half of the fingers on both sides, which can be a bit tricky depending on uh, uh, whether they are, uh, whether they have an even number of fingers or not. Often it's easier to avoid this and just offset the two walls and have them uh, on different levels. Maybe even one or two material thicknesses apart, so they there's basically material in between to, to connect all the forces. Um, another way for if you want to cross over uh, walls is to use slots. They are not very stable. Slots just means you have uh, slots like this and put, put, them, put the materials together like this. Um, this works really well for one direction because this, this, the thing slotted from above can be fixed to the bottom. And so the, you have a, a continuous uh, plate on top in the bottom that, that could flop around is, is bolted to the back. The problem is the other way around that those are basically unsupported on top. That can be okay. So if it's upside down, if it's on the side like for, for, for some storage, you make sure that those are the ones that are vertical so that they, they can take the load in the, in the right direction. If you put them this way, they will just bend down and be not great, not supported well. You can, of course, join them in front with some other piece that connects both directions again, if that's something that's, that's useful or feasible. Um, one thing I really like, but it's actually not that useful, are flat, flat uh, dovetails. The only really serious use case are those rounded boxes where we have one piece that wraps around and we need to basically join them back in front. Um, other than that, they are a good way to create pieces that are bigger than your laser cutter. These are pretty big ones, but they can be made very small, like only three millimeters or something. And then if, if you put them with a lot of uh, pressure, with a lot of... Uh, if you make the cut very tight and you uh, combine them with a the hammer, they, they are basically like, like one piece. They are surprisingly uh, strong. Another thing that, that just looks fancy is, is, is flex. I've done quite a lot with that. Flex works well if it is constrained to the radius. Uh, if, you have, if, you're, if you have constrained the maximum radius, uh, you can bend them. So there's a lot of things that use this as hinges, and I've never found them that particularly well working because uh, of fatigue. Um, uh, this, they will always um, break at some point. Also, if it are, the problem here also is that the forces in this direction are also carried by these very tiny pieces. And basically, there's very little uh, wood fibers that go in this direction. And if there's some defect in the, in the plywood at exactly that point, it will just break. And so that's, it's very fragile. It works pretty well with this, these uh, uh, doors because it's in a track and there's, there's no way it's bent too much. Um, it also works reasonably well if you do it in corners like we saw before, but it's not that great if you allow users overbend it. <laughs> That's something you just need to avoid. Um, hinge hardware is something that can be done uh, with laser cutting that works really works reasonably well. I'm not too much of a fan of those uh, wooden axles because they have a lot of, for one, they need to be bigger and uh, the bigger they are, the more torque you get on the axle and the, the more the high friction matters. Um, so often it's worth doing the, at least the axle in steel. Some piece of nail is typically is sufficient because steel is harder than wood and you don't, so you don't need anything fancy, fancy to make this work. But um, 
the steel axle one work actually pretty nicely. They are a bit more bulky than than a metal uh, hinge. On the but on the flip side, they put the forces on a larger area of your surrounding piece, so it's has it has its benefits. Um, gears work work reasonably well, even if cut from woods. Uh, Surprisingly, wooden gears have been used for centuries, even if they are typically made of, of hardwoods and all the, all the uh, gear, uh, gear teeth are filed uh, to perfection. Um, we are limited in what kind of gears, gears we can do because we are only cutting straight down, so we are uh, limited to... Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, to straight gears. Um, the... If we think we would rather have metal gears, we would, or we can compensate for this to some extent by making the gears larger. A larger gear has a larger radius, which means the same torque can be transferred with less force. And we can also make the gear teeth bigger, um, which also allows transferring larger forces. So we can, if we have the space, we can afford it because the gears are much, much lighter than the same gear in steel. Um, you can also use rack and pinion. Um, and what I think, what I especially like is adding the gears directly to the place, to the things we want to move. So we can make, basically, we don't have to buy a beer, uh, gear and, and bolt it to somewhere. We can just have the thing come with a rack or come with a gear profile. Um, and it's a way to have relatively huge gears for reasonably cheap. So I have, a, in one of my robots, I have a 20 centimeter gear, and it's just not an issue. Um, you could do even bigger ones, like if you have an, I've seen a turntable being done that has like, I don't know, 50 centimeters or 60 centimeters uh, annual ging, uh, ring gear inside there to turn that by a small motor. It's easy, doable. Um, There's some discussion whether you want ball bearings or, or simple axles. A lot of uh, commercial gears actually don't have ball bearings, but just have like pins and maybe a sleeve in, in, in brass. And in my experience, this, this works fine if you don't transfer huge, huge powers. Um, and you basically only need gears if you want to have to, your output axle being able to support side loads or something like that. So if you want to have uh, a pulley, which you also can laser cut very easily, um, with a lot of side pull, you might want to use uh, uh, ball bearings. As we are on the topic of ball bearings and time, um, as we already told, they're a great way to increase the contact area with your wooden parts. Um, you can layer, use multiple layers to create a, a bearing seat. Basically, uh, have one or two layers with the outer diameter of the bearing, and then have a, another layer with a smaller hole, basically preventing the ball bearing to move inside. Um, the, the general rule is only use two ball bearings per axle to not over constrain them. And if you really want to do have precision, you should pre tension the bearings against each other so that uh, to basically get out the movement and play from those bearings. But that's not laser cutting thing, that's more of a ball bearing thing. Um, I thought about using wood, wooden bearings, basically just put a couple of balls into a, a recess, but I think wood is... Uh, Especially the woods we are typically using are mostly too soft for that because uh, if you're using bearing balls, they basically create point loads and wood really doesn't like that. So it, you will get, if, if, if the bearing gets a hit, you will get dents in your, in, your, uh, in your race and that's just not good. So there, maybe there's some ways this can be done, but there's no obviously, ob obvious way of making this work that I've seen. Um, another thing, 
that's interesting and, and, and it's even more experimental is using springs. Basically, uh, when we talk about springs here, we are saying cutting springy parts out of the material and using that as springs. Um, there are a couple of interesting use cases for, for latches and stuff like this, but it's, it's very tricky. Um, one thing I learned is uh, one way to make these springs have a little bit more give is narrowing them down from their full, either from their full width to a quarter, or if they are in the other direction, from their full height to half their height. Uh, this gives about 40 to 60 percent more movement for the same stress in the same length. There's a very nice uh, document from Bayer, which produces uh, a lot of a lot of plastics. Um, that's most of this is not a, is more of a 3D printing stuff, but that's where I found this. It's a, it's a really nice document for all these bottle caps and snap fits and whatever. Uh, another way to, uh, we can use is a torsion bar. Uh, that's basically just a strip of material. We can in the middle put a latch that that twists basically out of plane. Um, Um, as we discussed with torsion, it's good if this has a more or less squarish um, uh, cross-section. Another thing that, that I've used or, and seen is, is using doing buttons. If you have an enclosure, you can basically put a, a couple of, of long springs around one area, so you can press the area down and press onto buttons. Um, for all springs, it's very important to protect them from overextending. So you should have a an, an, an dead stop so that if you use or press the buttons, they cannot break it, but it will bottom out. So why do I have limited success with that? Um, many materials will creep. Creep means the material will give under continued load. So this is different from fatigue. Fatigue requires you to move back and forth all the time. Creep just means if you're putting under load, it will slowly deform and uh, turn into the new shape, basically. Um, this is particularly bad with, uh, with wood for some reason, um, and, but also uh, several plastics do uh, uh, experience that. Um, so, one way to, to deal with that is to basically construct around that. So, to, to anticipate that and make sure your stuff still works. So, this is an example that I also do have here, where I have these tops and, that, and, and they're, they don't rely on them being fully extended. They are basically just there to, to, to take off shear forces. For the, the shear forces are not seen by the spring itself. Um, the, and also the, the, the force that's actually there doesn't really matter. It doesn't rely on the, on the strength of the, of the spring. It just, the string is just there to push the, these uh, pins back out if you're, if you're putting this on top of the enclosure. And of course, they are also naturally limited in the, in the way they can do. They can, as you can see, they're basically, um, they can't be pulled out, and, but they can also, yeah, you could, trap them and push them in, but, but if you press them from the outside, they are basically also limited in what a reasonable person would do to them. If we have more time, it's getting close. Um, flexures are a very interesting uh, topic that I looked into. That's basically a me mechanism that relies on bending. It's super interesting. There's been a lot of fuss around this in the makersphere. I've not seen many things that are actually working well. Um, there's the open microscope project, that, but they are using 3D printing. Um, there's a lot of very cool and interesting stuff that can be done there, but I, I'm not far enough to give you advice on that, other than it's really cool. There's a talk and workshop from Emily uh, that you can find on, but that's, there's are most in, mostly indents and stuff like this, so if you have like a, a knob, you can make it uh, stop in both directions and things like that. They are not that advanced as I would like stuff to be. 
So that's something for our next talk in 10 years. The last thing, there will be a, a workshop meetup, basically as an extended Q&A and a discussion thing at 16.30, which is in half an hour, according to Mike Locke, in the room next door. Okay, that's it from my side. Questions? We have five minutes. Uh, how's your experience? How's your experience with different kinds of wood, or like MDF, for example? So we are mainly using uh, birch and poplar, and I think poplar is actually a pretty good wood. The problem is it's very soft on the outside. So it, the main problem is it's, it's lack of hardness. So it's good as a construction material, but it will the surface will get damaged easily. We've not been using harder woods than birch at all or, or barely. Um, I know there are other woods that are, for example, more spriggy, like, like ash, but we don't really have that. And so on. That's the point where there's still so much stuff to do, even after 10 years. Thank you. You mentioned that a typical slicer can be used to create um, like a 3D model out of a um, arbitrary uh, model. So how does it work? So does it um, output uh, each individual layer or? What is it? I've actually not done it myself. I just saw other people do it. But I think it, it, it puts out uh, all the pieces. All right. So uh, just like a typical SVG um, yeah, yeah. cut that, that's, that's my understanding. I've not actually done it myself. All right. And uh, I, I don't know what slicer they used. But there was... I, I've seen a couple of, of uh, articles about that, but I didn't really look too deeply into that. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, there are a couple of samples from in front here to look from close. Feel free to, to touch them and look at them. And if you have more questions or more ideas, we can discuss them in the neighboring room and like 30 minutes. Thank you.